Hi everyone, welcome to our webinar today. The topic for today's webinar is pre-development funding for low and moderate income LMI solar and storage projects, a case study from New York. We have uh, an exciting panel of guest speakers lined up for you today. And I should also mention this webinar is being presented by the Clean Energy States Alliance, also known as CESA. And before I turn it over to our panelists, I'd like to go over a few very quick webinar logistics. You can use the orange arrow that you see circled here to minimize your webinar console. And you can also use that orange arrow to expand your webinar console, which you might like to do if you would like to submit questions or comments, which we encourage you to do. We'll save about 15 minutes at the end of our presentations for a Q&A with the audience. So please do type in your questions. We would love to hear from you. Um, a final note, this webinar is being recorded we will send you an email today or tomorrow with a copy of the webinar recording. And we'll also post those, um, the recording and the slides on our website, cisa.org slash webinars. And that's a good URL to know because it is also where all of our upcoming and archived webinar materials live. So with that, I am pleased to pass it over now to my colleague, Matt Olaf. Matt, over to you. Great, thanks so much, Sam, and thanks everyone for joining the webinar today. Um, as Sam mentioned, my name is Matt Olaf. Uh, I am a project manager at the Clean Energy States Alliance, or CESA. Uh, CESA is a national nonprofit made up of public agencies and organizations working together to advance clean energy. Next slide, please. CESA works with state leaders, federal agencies, industry representatives, and other stakeholders to develop clean energy programs and inclusive renewable energy markets. And you can see our uh, member organizations logos on your screen now. And next slide, please. So today's webinar is a product of CESA's Solar with Justice project. In the Solar with Justice project, CESA is looking into how states and community-based organizations can collaborate more effectively to advance solar in marginalized and low-income communities. The Solar with Justice project is primarily funded uh, by the U.S. Department of Energy's Solar Energy Technologies Office, as well as the Nathan's, Nathan Cummings Foundation, which provides additional financial support. Uh, next slide, please. In the webinar today, we will learn more about New York State's pre-development and technical assistance program for low and moderate income solar and storage projects. Uh, this program is the focus uh, of a recently published case study by CESA. The case study provided an overview of the program, as well as highlighting two uh, community-based organizations that have been awarded funding through the program. Uh, one of those community-based organizations is uh, presenting on the webinar today. Uh, this case study is the fourth in a series of case studies as part of the Solar with Justice program. The previous case studies and corresponding webinars are available on the CESA website. Uh, next slide, please. I'm excited today to be joined by three panelists um, who were part of the case study and who will describe uh, this pre-development program and their experience with the program. Uh, Chris Rogers is a project manager on NYSERDA's New York Sun team. Emily Ng is Director of Member Services with the Urban Homesteading Assistance Board, or UHAB. Lucia Santa Cruz is also with UHAB as their project associate. And we will be putting the full bios for all three of the panelists in the chat for more information about their work. Uh, before I hand it over to the panelists, if anybody has any questions, uh, please um, post those questions uh, in the chat and we will go through those at the end, after the presentations during the Q&A portion. So thanks again, and I'll hand it over to Chris. Thanks, Matt. So to see, kick things off, I'm just gonna run through an overview of how the pre-development program works, including talking a little bit about NYSERDA and the overall structure for the support for incentives for disadvantaged communities, low to moderate income communities, of which the Affordable Solar and Storage Pre-Development Technical Assistance Program is a key part of, of that program. And so to, to start off with, for those who are unfamiliar, New York Sun is essentially the name for the umbrella program for the incentives that 
NYSERDA, the New York State Energy Research and Development Authority, administers for all new grid-connected solar projects. Any new grid-connected solar project that is within um, uh, most of the territories of the state are eligible to receive incentives. And significantly, the, the overall mandate towards providing additional benefits to disadvantaged communities is expanded as part of the, the Climate Act, which is a landmark piece of legislation within the state of New York. The broad goals of the New York Sun program include a, an installation of 10 gigawatts of distributed capacity, but significantly, the, the, there's a portfolio of programs that we call the Solar Energy Equity Framework that focus on meeting that minimum target of a minimum benefit of 40% to disadvantaged communities. That includes solar moderate income households, disadvantaged communities, energy uh, justice and, and environmental justice communities, regulated affordable housing, how that is found across the state. And, and again, the, the pre-development program or the program opportunity notice 3414, um, as it, or I guess POM 3414 as it's often known as, is a significant part of that. And the way the pre-development program works overall, it, it's is, is that essentially there are grants that are provided to community-led projects. And so that includes community-based organizations um, specifically targeting affordable housing, low to moderate income households for the early stage development of solar and or storage projects. You know, the the actual applicants themselves, there's a, a wide range of applicants that would qualify and are eligible, but it's primarily going to be community-based organizations that have a large either affordable housing constituency, a low to moderate income household constituency. It can be owners and managers of regulated affordable housing, whether those be state agencies as part of housing authorities or a range of, of entities. Again, the state of New York is, is very diverse in terms of the types of the building types and the, the management of those building types across the state, whether that be in the, the continent center, the New York City region, in the upstate region or, or, or Long Island region. And so the, the applicants for this program it are necessarily, there's a, a wide range of, of types that that also qualify for that. And significantly, when we're talking about early stage development for these projects, a lot of times people think about projects in terms of once they're already off uh, up and running, but there's a lot of work that needs to happen, especially for affordable housing and a, a wide range of business models and, and activities that can be supported through this program. Um, it's it's a, a community solar project is gonna be very different from an on-site project and you know, projects that are built directly upon affordable housing are going to be very different from projects that may be located somewhere within the community that that your organization, the community-based organization is very much a part of, and they're going to use the grants to, or the, the funding from the grant to, to help facilitate the outreach, whether that be reaching the, the households themselves or providing more technical assistance guidance to a range of building owners who are interested in going solar, but they don't know what steps they're going to have to do. They don't know who they're going to have to work with. And they haven't gotten to the stage of, of looking at their, their buildings and even and getting to the sort of you know on the ground work and, and knocking on doors to let people know that they're they're working on these projects. Um, and next, you know, I, I want to talk through there's sort of been an evolution over time and, and sort of two phases of the project. I think of it as, or we think of it as, as round one and round two. The the first round, which went from around 2016 to 2018, uh, most of the projects were located within the, the Con Edison region. And this was sort of early on in the incentive structures that NYSERDA was providing for solar projects. Um, that were were focused on affordable housing, and the entirety of the program was limited to to the earliest development of solar. There was not the, the storage component, and so at that stage, you know, one of the the big issues, and I would say one of the biggest trends for projects at this time, was the grants were used to try to to navigate the the tricky ground of the large federal investment tax uh, credits opportunities that market rate projects are able to take advantage of. That is specifically the federal solar investment tax credit that if you are a, a nonprofit or a housing authority, you're not able to, to, to take advantage of it. And so the, the grants were, were to help people to try to find creative solutions to find tax equity investors, find people that could maybe monetize those tax credits, pass on those savings to, to affordable housing, as well as different sort of aggregated procurement that is just getting a group of buildings together instead of trying to find 
the right contractor for one building, maybe try to find you know five or six buildings and maybe get better better pricing. Uh, but there was there was some sustained success, and, and overall, this resulted in around 12 megawatts of of projects across around around 20 grants. Um, but then there were some, you know, based off of the feedback that we received on the the first round of the program, we tried to make it easier for for applicants to to access the funding. Try to make it clearer that the funding existed in in the first place. Um, we tried to minimize the you know some of the barriers to to submitting grant applications, and we tried to expand the the ways that you could use the funding most notably with the addition of storage as an approved technology instead of restricting it to just the the storage project a lot of folks in, in affordable housing are interested in solar and storage projects and, and we want to to expand the the availability of, of using fundings to to sort of explore what are the options out there for the type of projects that would benefit your your housing um, the the most as well as there's some increased integration with some related incentives that NYSERDA now offers, including the Inclusive Community Solar Adder, which is focused on community solar projects that are dedicating capacity to disadvantaged communities, which is, has some, some serious overlap, some obvious overlap with the, the pre-development program. And so what we've sort of seen now in, in the, it, it, you could either think of it as, as round two or as the pre-development program 2.0, um, we've seen a, a larger geographic spread of, of projects, of, of applications and, and grants that have been, been awarded um, in, in the state. And, and we've also seen as, as more knowledge has, has come into, uh, I guess, across affordable housing is the, the type of ways that you can use this funding, the ways that you can get products off the, off the, the ground. We've seen less of the focus on tech equity investors and, and, and just more focusing on providing technical assistance to, to different community-based organizations and, and housing authorities that are interested in these, these solar and storage projects and focusing on the savings to, to the low to moderate income households and disadvantaged communities that the organizations that are applying for the funding are, are trying to, to, to find the, the best way to benefit these, uh, these communities. And the, the expansion of storage and, and that flexibility, you know, that, that's just one of the ways in which we've seen sort of, uh, I guess I would say, uh, growth in this area of, of, of um, providing additional benefits. Um, the, the last thing I just want to talk through is, you know, what's what's NYSERDA's role. But I wanted to start off with in that, you know, one of the, the strengths of the program is that NYSERDA is largely hands off in this program. And, and the success of, of the, the projects, it's really up to the, the grantees and the project teams themselves, you know, including uh, you have and, and a, a range of other grantees. You know, the, the goal is is for for NYSERDAs to respond to the needs and try to be as flexible as possible in terms of 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 what these uh, what the grantees will need in order to achieve their goals and, and to try not to get in the way of, of what they're doing. And and in general, developing solar and storage projects, it's, it can be a very dynamic process and there can be a lot of changes along the way. And maybe one of the strengths of the program is is the fact that it's it's less rigid than, than perhaps other pro programs in terms of, of reporting requirements and in terms of what is required to achieve the overall goals. But so the, the role of NYSERDA, in addition to really you know, sharing information in terms of lessons learned of, of what has come from, from other projects, I, I would really say the, the biggest role is, is sort of responding to what the needs of the grantees are in, in order to you know, achieve the overall objectives that they set out with. Uh, initially, and um, with that, um, I think that that wraps up my part in terms of the overview of how the program works and and where we are right now. Thanks, Chris. Um, so, hi everyone. I'm Emily Ng um, with you have the Urban Home Setting Assistance Board. Um, so. My colleague, uh, Lucia, and I will be talking about the Co-op Go Solar campaign, um, which our organization has worked with um, Chris and the New York Sun team at NYSERDA, um, which has enabled um, free technical assistance to low-income community of affordable housing cooperatives in New York City, um, and has really um, 
really supported that installation of solar and expansion of solar access to this community. Next, um, our organization is a nonprofit that empowers low to moderate income residents to take control of their housing and enhance communities through strong tenant associations and lasting affordable housing co-ops. So we work with both rental buildings and buildings in which um, it's owner occupied. Um, in the next few slides, you will see examples of some of the types of multifamily buildings that uh, we have worked with um, over the past 50 years. So there are more than a thousand co-ops throughout New York City. Um, and just the next three slides will actually show you um, the range um, of the types of buildings. We'll proceed next. Throughout the different boroughs, um, including Brooklyn, Manhattan, and the Bronx. So the buildings really range. Um, in terms of the, the residents and the people who live in the buildings, you know, since our founding, UHEB has uh, worked to support New Yorkers, mostly people of color, in creating decent affordable housing cooperatives, um, which are uh, resident controlled, resident run. Um, these co ops house mainly uh, people of color that are um, under 50% of the area median income to 120% of the area median income. So um, some of our lowest income New Yorkers. Uh, most of the co-ops are run by elder women of color. Up to half of the co-ops have majority of residents that speak Spanish at home. Next slide. Um, when we talk about the co-ops, uh, you'll hear us referring to HDFC. This, um, refers to uh, housing development fund corporations in New York State. These are designated corporations that provide affordable housing to low income families. Uh, there are many types of co-ops, including you know, uh, various ones uh, that are created through federal programs. So in every state, you, know, you will find different types of co-ops, affordable co-ops in, in your own state as well. Uh, but in New York, uh, this is a legal entity organized and the, the co-op corporation owns the building as well as the land that it sits on. And in this example, we see Hamilton Heights Community Housing Development uh, Fund Corporation, which is uh, scattered across 12 buildings. Um, uh, in many cases, it may be a building that is attached to another one on the same lot um, or scattered site or just a single building, ranging from three units to more than 100 units. Next slide. Um, and in terms of how this co-op is structured, the residents um, own uh, shares of the co-op corporation and run the buildings. It's affordable through a few different mechanisms, including that the resale price of the shares is limited, which helps keep the housing affordable for future generations. Um, in addition to that purchase price being lower than market and affordable, uh, these co-ops are limited equity co-ops and have income guidelines to ensure that the co-op is serving its intended population. Next slide. We see many challenges that the, the residents, the boards, the shareholders, the stakeholders face in operating their own uh, buildings, including rising costs, um, older housing stock that is inefficient and needs upkeep, uh, as well as ex Internal, in, internal and external factors, uh, which add strain um, on top of limited financial resources. So um, the dynamics within operating and running a co-op, um, including uh, leadership, uh, development, burnout, generational um, divides, uh, displacement and gentrification, which are you know, certainly factors that uh, threaten affordability. Next slide. Uh, we also need to acknowledge the impacts and legacy of redlining. Um, in the 1930s, the Home Ownership Loan Corporation maps of cities across the United States were used to indicate and uphold de jure segregation, uh, which refers to segregation mandated by law and enforced by the government. Um, and for decades, uh, banks in the United States denied mortgages to people based on skin color, preventing Black families from buying homes in certain neighborhoods from getting loans or building uh, home equity, which is, of course, the greatest source of wealth for most American families, and thus restricting the opportunity to build generational wealth. Um, on average, the net worth of a typical white family is nearly 10 times greater than that of a Black family. Uh, this image here 
indicates, we took the, the whole map, um, which shows the red lined areas and overlaid it with the location of the HDFC co-ops. Uh, so the, the dots represent where the HDFCs are located. And they are largely in red lined areas and neighborhoods that had seen a lot of disinvestment. Um, and so, you know, while we're talking about home, home ownership, we're also talking about situations of deferred maintenance, degrading housing stock, um, outdated or non-existent heating equipment, high energy and maintenance costs, which eat up income that might otherwise go to building improvement projects or to preventative maintenance that could um, could stabilize fi the finances for a building or building owners. Next slide. Um, and this legacy of environmental um, of redlining. Um, we also need to talk about the legacy of environmental racism. Um, environmental hazards, you know, we, we see situations where housing is located in areas situated next to highways or toxic sites, and the families um, that reside there are disproportionately facing impacts of environmental hazards first and worst. Next slide. Um, Low-income neighborhoods often have the worst air quality, increased or high um, cases of respiratory illnesses like asthma. And many studies have shown these kinds of increases in long-term exposure to air pollution is linked to COVID-19 uh, mortality rates. Next slide. We also know that energy burdens um, are a concern. Households that spend more than 6% of their income on energy costs are considered energy burden. And we know um, from nationwide study Black households face higher energy burden than white households at almost every um, position in the income distribution. Next slide. When you take the fact that these communities also face uh, the worst air quality and the kinds of lessons that we saw from the pandemic, we know that the impacts on communities of color and those residing in neighborhoods uh, with a lot of air pollution um, that have a lot of uh, deferred maintenance um, and and physical building needs, um, folks are also facing higher uh, mortality rates and other socioeconomic factors. Next slide. We also want to talk about how solar panels may um, contribute to better air quality uh, by reducing peaker plants, the dirtiest polluting power plants in the city, which rely on, um, uh, tur which turn on during peak hours um, to provide energy. We're able to reduce air pollution and uh, mitigate the kinds of impacts that we see. Next slide. Um, so you have climate resiliency team works to connect co-op residents with resources so that they can lead the way to a carbon free future. Um, we are having converse, we, we work with the residents and stakeholders and partners to increase access to energy measures, energy conservation, decarbonization measures to fight climate change, keep housing safe, healthy, and affordable. Um, so we're often having conversations about what physical building needs there are, what financial needs and financial resources are there, and provide support to navigate options for this community. Next slide. Um, solar has a steep upfront cost, um, but you know we're really approaching this through an environmental justice lens. As, uh, accessing clean energy is another dimension of that struggle for social justice. So we are focusing our efforts on bringing affordable solar and its economic benefits to low-income communities and communities of color, uh, building partnerships with community-based organizations in frontline neighborhoods that are uh, affected by environmental racism in order to ensure a just transition to clean energy and creating opportunities for underrepresented groups to become inspired about being part of the green economy and building in ways for leadership development to occur for uh, youth internships and career development opportunities. Um, solar is a renewable energy source that will continue to power the building for years to come and provide stable sources of electricity, no matter what electric grid prices are. So this is something that we're, we're very committed to uh, expanding access to solar. Next slide. And so our campaign, Co-op School Solar, was the first campaign to focus exclusively on uh, HDFC co-ops. And part of our goals was to increase awareness of renewable energy in the community and to make it accessible, uh, increase energy efficiency in the co-ops, as well as sustain uh, the co-ops into the future. We're doing that by providing free solar assessments, um, working with 
the decision makers to provide education and training and make sure that um, all of the stakeholders in the community have that information and are able to make informed decisions about you know when to go solar what that takes and how to make um, uh, decisions about that process financing options um, is a big part of what we are doing uh, just working closely with folks on uh, meeting their their needs on the, the financial needs whether they have reserves whether they um, have no money to put in towards solar projects we're providing support on um, contractor engagement and solar installer selection as well as support during and throughout the installation next slide um, now it's not a new idea in the community uh, the previous slide we actually had a photo of the um, a building in the Lower East Side of Manhattan in, from 1977, um, and you know we we see many of these examples of co-ops that have a long history of you know doing it themselves, uh, generating power, being on the forefront of energy and sustainability projects. Um, the, these slides here show the same building. Uh, they they added the a windmill as well as the solar heating, uh, water heating panels on on their rooftop. Um, and because of this co-op, Hearthstone HDFC, uh, net metering is possible today. Um, and through this next slide, through the support of NYSERDA, our campaign provides free technical assistance to take that guesswork out of that equation um, for the building owners about feasibility, about costs, providing that advisement um, and you know every step of that process to ensure uh, that building owners can focus on making an a informed decision about whether to adopt solar with an eye to ownership. Um, we're doing this in a way that provides education, engages the community um, as you know, all ages, as much of the community as we can. So far, we have two dozen, more than two dozen uh, co-ops that have committed to solar installations. About 20 of them um, have installed solar arrays that are up and running. Um, these co-ops will save over $5 million collectively over the course of the panel's lifetime. And there are almost a thousand families benefiting from the savings and thousands of tons of um, carbon dioxide, methane are avoided by switching to clean energy. Um, in the first round of our campaign, there were uh, 500 kilowatt DC and the second round had uh, 400 kilowatt DC um, commitments. And so we're very excited about the impact that um, the campaign and the support of NYSERDA has had on um, making solar feasible in the community. Next slide. Um, and you know, we, we, we talked a little bit earlier about um, the environmental justice perspective, but really you know, by, by making it accessible, meaningful, involving, um the stakeholders and building owners in this process they are our partners you know not just clients right um but there are partners every step of the way and that's part of what makes this program successful next slide our first co-op school solar campaign um, is called solar uptown now it was a collaboration between the act for environmental justice um, a harlem-based um, environmental justice organization uh, solar Once Here Comes Solar Team, Sustainable CUNY, which is a city university um, of New York and our organization. And the idea was to bring Northern Manhattan community members together um, in a solar purchasing group. Um, community members got to provide input, help evaluate and select installers. Um, and because they purchased solar in bulk, the installer was able to give them a discount in the pricing and committed also um, at, the, at the, their request had committed to hiring community members um, involved in the campaign to be solar installers. So we had 11 buildings in this phase, including nine co-ops. Uh, they collectively got 30% lower average pricing than average um, on the equipment and installation. So that's a little bit of the history about how um, our work started and came to be, you know, and, and this community control aspect, community decision making, cutting costs are really at the core of what um, Co-op School Solar is working towards. Next slide. And solar costs have declined dramatically in recent decades, and there are uh, many incentives and tax credits and things that enable making solar affordable and support of agencies like NYSERDA. Um, but you know, despite 
those kinds of resources, New Yorkers still face barriers, um, including uh, construction red tape, system complexity in multifamily buildings, uh, dense urban environments that don't allow for solar farms, um, and affordable housing has um, additional you know, complexity. Oftentimes we find that installers may not be able to communicate or have the capacity to communicate with all of the, the stakeholders and the questions that come up. And we find that our um, organization and campaign is able to provide um, support and you know be a bridge in that process. But we're really addressing the barriers and making solar possible. Um, I'm going to pass it to my colleague, Lucia, um, to talk about saving money with solar and some of the case studies of buildings that we have worked. Uh, thank you, Emily. Um, I, yeah, as Emily said, I'm going to talk a bit about uh, how HDFC started saving money with solar. Uh, can you all still see my screen? Um, okay, great. Uh, so first, I wanted to talk about uh, how solar savings are seen by these buildings. Uh, so firstly, solar can get give buildings utility bill savings. Uh, every kilowatt hour that a building produces uh, gives them um, is money that you're not using or giving to the utility in order to get energy. Uh, so if you produce more than you need in a month, uh, you can use the credits the following month. Uh, it's kind of spread out throughout the summer and the winter. And as the cost of electricity goes up, um, buildings realize more savings. Uh, so really installing solar is a way to make sure uh, that you can save on your electric bill uh, in the future as well. Um, so how do buildings see the savings? Not only do you see savings in your bills, uh, but residents can also see individual savings uh, as well as building. Uh, there is a federal tax credit uh, that residents can access as well as a state tax credit. Um, and the building also gets a property tax abatement of 20% uh, and sees solar savings. Uh, these taxes, uh, some folks might not be able to access uh, if they're on a fixed income, uh, so these are a bit restrictive, but overall folks are able to tap into different incentives once they have solar installed in their building. Um, and solar savings are pretty big. Uh, even without the tax incentives, solar systems generally pay for themselves in four to eight years. Uh, usually when we see a four year payback period, we encourage folks to go solar as they will see their money come back to them pretty quickly. Um, and they will continue to save money for decades. Usually solar panels have a warranty of 25 years. Uh, they will probably last longer, uh, but you will see saving for a couple of decades at least. Um, so just talking a bit about financing, um, there are solar loans, uh, power purchase agreements, and other ways to get uh, financing from solar. A lot of the buildings that we work with uh, purchase solar with their reserves. Um, others have gotten loans, other specific loans for solar, and then there are also third party owned um, ways to get solar on your roof. Uh, so a power purchase agreement, for example, is uh, when another company goes to your roof, uh, puts the solar in for free, and is basically leasing your roof um, to use the solar. Uh, so you will get some credits, but not all of them. Most of them go to the company. And then in the end, folks can buy the solar array from the installer. Um, and there's also community solar, uh, which I will talk a bit about later, but that's also an option for buildings that might not have the upfront cash or might not be able to apply for a loan. Uh, so what makes a building roof viable for solar? Uh, there are a lot of things that buildings have to have in order to be good for solar. Uh, they have to have direct sunlight and minimal shading, a uh, large available roof area, uh, ideally a new roof uh, or a roof with a long life ahead. Uh, and they have to leave paths along the perimeters, as you can see here. Uh, there are FDNY regulations uh, that say that there has to be a certain amount of space in between the solar panels and the edges so that people can walk around the panels. Um, this building is a great candidate for solar. There's buildings that have smaller roofs, uh, and there are also different kinds of solar arrays. So for smaller roofs, we usually see canopy arrays. I will be talking about a building that got a canopy array a bit later. 
Um, but there are different models that you can look into depending on the size of your roof. And our team does offer free cost estimates for HDFCs, also for these low income co-ops. So we help them figure out first if solar might be viable for their building, and then we look at the costs. And you can look at your building quickly on Google Earth and kind of see the roof, um, just to see the size and if there's anything blocking on the roof that might make solar harder. Um, so I'm going to talk a bit about a couple of case studies. Uh, the first building that I want to talk about is 828 Park Place. Uh, it's a small HDFC co-op in uh, Crown Heights in Brooklyn. Uh, they're an eight unit HDFC and they got solar installed in 2018. This building went through our first co-op school solar campaign um, and they got solar installed at the same time as they were getting uh, heat pumps installed as well. Uh, they use heat pumps for current, uh, currently for cooling. Um, so this building has a community shared solar system. So they use uh, the credits to distribute to individual apartments in the building. Uh, when we did the estimate, we realized that the building could produce more energy than just offsetting the common area. So they are also offsetting some of the individual bills. Um, and the building is using a canopy array to maximize solar production on a relatively small roof. On this, in this photo, you can see the canopy. This is what a canopy array looks like. It's usually pretty tall, uh, giving space for folks to use the roof. Um, here they installed a green roof a couple uh, months ago, and now they have a green roof and solar panels and they can use this space uh, for the tenants to hang out. Um, they also signed a climate action pledge. Uh, you have in Solar One created a, a climate action pledge a couple of years ago through our COP School Solar campaign in order to engage tenants not only in installing solar in the building, but also just thinking about what action they can take to fight climate change generally. Um, so we do have other resources for folks to plug in, uh, meet different environmental justice groups, figure out what they can do in their community uh, to fight for um, climate justice. Uh, so this building is one of the buildings that has signed the pledge, and we have about a dozen buildings now that have signed and are kind of, we have a growing network of buildings that are supporting each other. Um, so more quick facts about this building. Um, they paid uh, with their reserves, so it was a cash payment. Uh, they could afford the, the mm -hmm. solar array. Um, the upfront cost was $135,000. The payback period was only two years, which is pretty uh, fast for a uh, payback period for solar, which is great. Uh, and they have not only canopy, but also planar array. Uh, so you can see these uh, solar panels that are a bit lower down. Uh, those are called planar. It is a bit uh, less expensive than a canopy. Uh, so they decided to have uh, planar here and um, canopy in the back. Uh, also, because I believe they're in a historic district, uh, so you can't see the solar panels from um, from the street. And they also got a historic tax credit, which made everything uh, less expensive. Uh, this building was also the first HDFC to install solar in the city after the one that Emily mentioned uh, and the first one to install solar with our campaign. Um, I wanted to mention another HDFC that is currently in the process of installing solar, uh, Maple Court HDFC in Manhattan. Um, the address is 1901 Madison Avenue. This is a very large HDFC, about 150 units. Uh, it's going to have a huge system uh, more than 200 kilowatts, which is great. Uh, their payback period is seven years, uh, which is longer than the last uh, building we saw, but they're going to be producing a lot of energy and they will have annual savings of around $30,000, uh, which is very big for these kinds of buildings. Um, I wanted to bring up this building as well, just to talk about the process uh, of our program. Uh, so this building came to us interested in solar, um, but they're also concerned about local law 97. So you have uh, works to offer different energy efficiency support uh, to HDFCs. And we are looking into the local law 97 compliance pathways for affordable housing with this building and trying to figure out how they can 
use some of the savings they'll get from solar to pay for some of the uh, the work that they'll have to do through Local on 97. Um, and this building is also using other incentive programs uh, to do this energy work. Also, they're getting a boiler clean and tune uh, pretty soon for their 16 boilers. They're getting incentives with a incentive program that the utilities and NYSERDA are offering. Uh, so we really try to help buildings connect with different programs and get as many rebates and incentives as possible in order to make sure that this work is affordable. And the building is going to be getting a ballasted array. Uh, it's taken a couple months uh, for going back and forth with the board. As Emily mentioned, we work with boards, um, so sometimes it takes a while to make decisions. Um, so we really make sure that we are educating folks in the buildings, that the board is able to ask those questions and everyone is informed as possible before they move forward with these decisions, since these are costly projects. Um, now I'll talk a bit about community solar. Um, our campaign also offers community solar as an alternative pathway for buildings that are not able to install rooftop solar. But we also encourage buildings with solar to uh, subscribe as well, specifically residents. Um, so as Emily mentioned, solar costs have declined dramatically in recent decades, but there are still barriers uh, for solar installations that a lot of New Yorkers face. Uh, these include complex permitting systems, um, also solar installers working with single family homes. We also see that sometimes installers think that the project is too small, so it's not worth working with or worth in investing in if there are bigger projects in the market. Uh, and there's also lack of accessibility to access solar for renters, um, as well as a roof having a lot of shade uh, and not enough space to install solar. Uh, which is why we think community solar is also a very important part of the puzzle. Uh, so community solar allows uh, solar energy to be accessible to everyone. Uh, so individual folks can sign up. This is free. Uh, we estimate uh, around $100 of savings in a year. Uh, so you sign up for 12 months. Uh, it's auto renewed. Um, it moves with you if you move. Um, and I will talk a bit about how this works in case folks are not familiar with community solar. Uh, so how does community solar work? Uh, this is just a quick graphic um, describing it, but I think the next slides explain it a bit better. So I'm going to jump to the next slide. Um, so a solar panel off-site produces energy. This can be in a warehouse or somewhere in the city uh, that has a very big roof. And each month the solar panel um, will produce solar energy. This energy, once you sign up, uh, will go to the Con Edison grid and you will get the solar credits. Uh, so you don't have to install solar on your roof. You would just sign up for a solar system somewhere else. Uh, the solar energy will go into the grid and then you will get the credits that are produced by this system. This is a bit about what the bill would look like. Uh, so every month you will receive a uh, solar credit adjustment on your bill. So you will basically get a discount. Um, we've seen that the monthly savings are about five to $10 every month. Uh, for affordable housing, it is about 10% of your electric bill a month. Um, and now I'm going to start talking about other things that our campaign does, uh, since I know we don't have a lot of time left. Um, so our Club School Solar campaign offers, apart from technical assistance for installing solar and uh, for registering for community solar, we offer uh, educational resources, which we think are very important. Uh, we have Solar 101 workshops where we talk about how solar works, uh, what community solar is, what different kinds of solar systems are out there, and really make sure that folks have as much information as possible before they even start thinking about solar. Sometimes we get folks who don't know anything about solar energy. Sometimes we get folks who are already thinking about installing solar in the building. Uh, sometimes we encourage folks from a building where the board has made the decision to install solar to come so they know what's going on in their building. Uh, but we also have other workshops, uh, like workshops that focus on financial literacy, uh, we have workshops that focus on um, 
heating, uh, clean heating on how to make your building more energy efficient in general. And we also have a new workshop all based on electrification. And we are trying to see how solar can be paired with heat pumps and with electrification to offset some of those costs. Uh, we also offer solar tours. Um, so our solar tours are usually pretty popular since they include a portion uh, that is based on solar 101. So we go through how the technologies work, but then we get to go up to the roof of an HDFC, so a local affordable housing co-op and look at the panels and look at the technology uh, and folks from solar one which are really experts get to kind of explain to people how these things work uh, they show folks the inverters and the different parts of the system and we usually have space for q a's and folks can ask very specific questions about their buildings although we also offer one-on-one -on -one consultations with uh, with buildings that are interested in solar um, apart from that, um, you have STEAM also offers education, more education and career development opportunities. Apart from the solar workshops and the smaller workshops that we have, we also have an operation and maintenance training program that offers free classes for HDFCs uh, on different building systems and how to run these more efficiently. So this has been helpful to empower folks to learn about the systems in their building and really want to make decisions about them and make sure that their buildings are more energy efficient. We've learned that folks who have a lot more information uh, are a lot more ready to make decisions uh, and more encouraged to make decisions that will make their building more energy efficient and hopefully lead to decarbonization. Um, just wanted to show the Climate Action Pledge as well. As I mentioned before, um, the first building that I spoke about signed the Climate Action Pledge a couple of years ago. This is a resource that was designed for HDFCs um, to identify and commit to projects that support environmental health of their residents and neighborhoods. And we have a guidebook uh, which provides information about the projects that are accessible to these buildings and to affordable housing generally in New York City. Uh, so we list out what programs are out there, how they work, how they work, who is eligible, and also just general things that you can do uh, to make your neighborhood more green and more sustainable. Um, here you can see what the Climate Action Pledge guidebook looks uh, inside, what kind of information we have. And uh, finally, wanted to leave some time for Q&A since I know folks uh, might want to ask some questions. Uh, so that was all from me. Um, Thank you all for listening. I'll leave some space for folks to ask questions. Great, thanks so much to our panelists. Yeah, we'll transition to the Q&A portion right now. And a reminder, if anybody has any questions to please post those. Um, we've gotten several questions so far, mostly directed to UHAB. Um, so on that last point about um, operation and maintenance, uh, does the annual savings um, include repair and maintenance of certain types of solar systems? Or since you're training people um, within the buildings to do that, is that not a cost, if that makes sense? Uh, yeah, I, that's a good question. I, I think it, generally we try to leverage as many programs and resources as possible. So, you know, uh, the, the New York Sun and NYSERDA uh, financing for crops co solar and support for crops co solar uh, enabled us to develop materials, trainings, um, bilingual materials as well, and trainings, um, basically a toolkit for the process of going solar. Um, we we try to leverage other resources to make you know ongoing uh, kind of maintenance for the building really accessible too. Um, with regards to solar, uh, yes, I think like once a building makes an installation and you know has their array it's not like that concludes their participation you know as lucia mentioned um many of these buildings have actually come and joined um the climate action pledge and are the ones that then open their doors for solar tours on site at their you know at their buildings when their system's up and running um and we ha we have other kind of adjacent partnerships um uh with nicerta to provide general maintenance support for 
the entire building. So not just for solar, right, but, you know, heating systems and, um, you know, thinking about how to convert heating systems to clean energy. I hope that answers the question. Great. Yeah, thanks. A couple of questions related to savings. Um, so a question about for the solar uptown now, is the 30% uh, lower price number based on the total cost of the project, which would include things like permitting, labor costs, or is the 30% reduction just based on materials? Uh, materials and also labor. Um, and it's really this idea that we used in the first rounds that um, I should also clarify that we, we found that um, it, it was not necessarily something that we continued in the second round of the campaign, um, but this idea that um, by, you know, by using the economy of scale that we would be able to make solar more affordable. Uh, we found by the second round that there was a lot to kind of time and match up in terms of, you know, how many buildings, in that case, it was a cluster within a certain neighborhood. Um, but as, as we worked closely with the co-op community and the stakeholders and they made the decision to go solar, um, sometimes uh, building owners didn't actually want to wait for the next purchasing group. Um, and so we found that we had to be somewhat flexible in, in um, you know, kind of matching the needs of uh, both the, the building owner community as well as the installers when it came to the solar purchasing groups. Great, thank you. And another question about the savings uh, for the Brooklyn building. If the upfront cost for solar was 135,000, how is the payback period only two years? Exclamation mark. Yeah, and we sh yes, that slide actually doesn't reveal the full finances of it. Um, they were able to access many tax credits and incentives, um, including a historic tax credit because they happen to be in a neighborhood that you know has such a designation. Um, what that meant is in the design of the solar, they had to actually set back um, the um, the, the solar array. And uh, you'll see actually pictures in the CESA um, uh, case study report uh, of, the, of their system, but it's set back from the front, you know, so it's not visible from the street. Um, and through the various incentives and tax credits they were able to offer, the out-of-pocket purchase price actually came out to less than $6,000 for this co-op. So even though we say the upfront purchase you know, pr price was 120 in the 120,000 range. Um, you know, it it was incredibly economically beneficial for this building, um, and that economic case is there not just for their building, but also you know, even in cases where someone isn't able to um, access the historic tax credits. Emily, I just quickly checked on this, and the total incentives they got were 117,000 uh, dollars. Just an incentive, so that's why the payback period was so low. But we should probably add that to the sides. Uh, that is a great question. Yeah, thanks, Lucia. Yeah, thank you. Um, all right, we'll bring Chris into it. Uh, with my CERTA um, from administering the program, do you guys track housing types uh, that benefit or participate in the program? Um, are there certain housing types that um, are more common to benefit from the program, housing types that maybe are more difficult to reach still? Yeah, that's, I mean, that, I guess that question really depends on, it is, is highly dependent on the region and the state. And so, and, and because this grant program supports projects, Long Island, Con Edison, upstate, and the upstate region is so large, depending on where you are in, in the upstate region, it's going to be very, very different. The largest concentration of multifamily housing, um, especially those, you know, above, you know, six, seven floors, that's that's going to be in New York City within the, the Con Edison region. That's just going to look very different from... Uh, buildings that are everywhere else in the state. But then when you look at, in terms of the economics of solar, that's largely dependent on what the electricity prices are. And so you're looking at, you know, Long Island, you know, buildings in a, in a lot of ways, they, the typology can be very similar to what you would see in maybe some area in the upstate, but then the overall economics are different. And so the, the, the buildings that will work on are gonna be fundamentally different from the ones, uh, the type of buildings that will work elsewhere in in the state um i i guess the 
you know, in, in terms of, of other than the region of the state, the other, uh, a very common issue, because this program, you know, it's supposed to support low to moderate income households wherever they may be found, but that be single family, multifamily housing, a very common issue that is facing any type of low to moderate income household is the, the roof condition. And so I would say that they challenge, if you're talking about single family homes, um, roof repairs is, is going to be a, a significant barrier. I mean, that's gonna be a barrier for any any building, but it's it, in terms of, there's not very many incentives that will focus on roof repairs. And, and if, if you don't have the right roof condition, that, that's just the end of the project, um, regardless of the, the solar radiance or you know the exposure to the sun and a lot of other technical issues. And so that'll just kind of, um, uh, that, that will, that will almost disqualify a building to, to start off with, but it's, it, yeah, it's, um, there's a, I think you start with the economics of, of the building and then you get into space considerations, you know, larger flat roofs that you can find in, in the upstate region, if there's different opportunities that you'll find there, but you've got to find the right balance between what it's going to cost you and, and what you're offsetting. And that's, that's going to be more, I think dispositive than necessarily the, the the building type, even though those will be reflected within a different geographic region. So I hope that sort of provides some context for for what what you'll see, what we have seen. I guess the question was, are we tracking that? Um, it comes up in in the the submissions from the grants. Um, I think it's it's there's some limited tracking for overall NYSERDA incentives that that we have um, beyond just this program. Um, but you know there are I think we focus more on the the cost of this the cost of those installations and other components. Great, thanks. And related, we have a question about roof condition, and I want to know if this is similar with UHAB's experience. Um, if uh, one of your buildings roof is not able to support the weight or is in poor condition to support solar, is it a done deal, or have you you know used pre-development funding to address to maybe repair roofs to make to get solar on those roofs um we we haven't in the case of um our involvement in in the NYSERDA uh pre-development this this uh funding to use it for a roof directly but um this is something that comes up and and we sort of take this long view where um as Chris mentioned, that that's something that can stop the project from proceeding. So uh, our goal is to figure out how that might be a solar project, you know, three years from now, five years from now, and really work with the building owners to access resources to address the roof condition uh, more immediately, not necessarily through this program, but through, um, you know, other means, uh, whether that's through municipal um, uh, support or oversight agencies. Many of the the buildings that we work with are governed either by the city's housing agency, housing preservation development uh, department, or uh, at the state level, um, homes and community renewal. So actually like um, 1901 Madison, Maple Court, HDFC, which Lucia um, showcased, uh, you know, had a reserve fund and working with HCR on, um, you know, talking about how they're able to, um, use reserves operational reserves or repair reserves towards projects like this is some you know it's part of the um technical assistance that we provide so by the means that we're able to uh, addressing the roof condition is um is crucial because it's not just about the solar you know if we're talking about moving towards clean energy and converting heating systems to um, electrification you know roof condition is also going to be very important for those kinds of projects as well. Uh, we often see that those roofs, facades are the things that are the um, the, the types of projects that really stop um, folks from engaging in our solar campaign and you know trying to address those barriers as well as you know talking about the project economics. Um, they do need the roof condition to be suitable for solar to install solar. But once solar is installed, that savings can actually help capitalize the boiler project or the elevator project that maybe has been deferred for a number of years. Great, thank you. And a quick question here, what is an inclusive community solar adder? I don't know if that was specifically mentioned. Or does that question not resonate? Chris, I think. 
Um, well, yeah, yeah, I may, I'd have to think about that for, for a little bit. Okay, sorry, I'm not sure what that's in reference to. Um, let's see, we're almost at time. Let me ask a question, just taking a step back. You have, you mentioned um, uh, that you're tracking emissions reductions as a result of these projects. You also mentioned the environmental justice uh, impacts of peaker plants in these communities. Um, have you seen a correlation between development of projects and reduction of peakers in these communities or are those things kind of disconnected? Um, we we haven't analyzed that data in the long run, but that is something that yeah would be important to you know um, to think about making that case. I mean, many of the the largest concentration of the co-ops that um, we work with are in areas like Harlem and the South Bronx, where you know you see highways cutting through, um, and you know that's another um, legacy of the kinds of urban planning that had taken you know taken root in decades prior. Um, yeah, I think that's something that that is is something we'll keep it continue to keep an eye on. But oftentimes, folks in the community ask us, well, you know, if if they're not necessarily um, like thinking about sustainability at the forefront, the question is, well, how how is solar going to make a difference? Um, and we we really want to um, talk about how it's not just the economics, not just the the, the isolated project, but it has a larger community impact on air quality and um, that connection to, you know, what's going on in our neighborhoods and, you know, sited around our, our homes. Great, thank you. Well, we're at time. Chris, did you, the um, community solar adder, did you, did we figure out what that is in reference to? Yeah, I mean, is, is that just like the, um, well, I guess there's there's the community adder and then there's inclusive community solar adder. And then, so are, are we are we talking about that? The latter, yeah. The, um, I, I guess, and in terms of like the, the timing of that, I mean, I guess we're, we're, we're still in the process of, I think we had a webinar a month or so ago about, about launching that. And I can maybe follow up with with the details on on that specifics. But for the um, but for the pre-development program, there there are there's criteria for projects that are are going for both. Um, that you just need to make make sure that you know if if you're a project that's going after the community solar adder and you're going after pre-development funding, um, there's documentation. But there are I have a couple of other colleagues that I can follow up with. You know, there's there's a whole presentation on on how that launched that I'd love to I could share more details on. Great, thanks, Chris. There are additional questions in the chat. We'll follow up with folks individually uh, based on these. Thanks again to our panelists. Um, great presentations, and I will pass it over to my colleague Sam to close us out. Thanks very much. Um, so before everyone heads out, I just want to let you know about a bunch of webinars that we have coming up. Um, we have one tomorrow on battery decommissioning, recycling, and reuse. I just saw a question coming in about materials recycling, so I hope that person registers for that. It'll also be recorded like today's webinar was. And then um, another webinar, uh, September 28th, energy storage for peak demand reduction with uh, Efficiency Maine. They'll be talking about their new incentive program. And then we have NYSERDA back on October 3rd. I don't think it's Chris, but a couple other folks from NYSERDA to talk about their state energy financing fund and DOE's loan programs office um, financing clean energy at the state level. So all of those details are on our website, cisa.org slash webinars. Again, um, today's webinar was recorded. We'll have slides and a recording out soon. Thank you so much to everyone who attended and typed in questions. And thank you most of all to our panelists. This was really great. We hope to see everyone at the next one. Bye. Thanks, everyone. Have a good rest of your day.